Hi, everyone, officially to those who are joining us live and also those who are watching this in post. Um, I am Tammy from Advaya. Uh, and today we are going to be in conversation, although I'll probably be mostly listening um, to with these wonderful, wonderful guests. Um, the first who is Predrag, who is the co host and curator of our upcoming um, and newest course, Biocivilization, Biocivilizations. Um, and it is now available to register on our new website, um, advaya.life. For those of you who haven't checked out our new website, we have a fancy new website um, where all of our stuff sits on. Um, and we will get into the themes of Biocivilizations today. Um, but essentially, this is going to be a conversation uh, that strings together a few different um, spaces and fields. So ecology, biology, philosophy, and poetry, um, among others. Uh, and that's kind of the, the gist of the course is really to bring those worlds together and also to kind of fall in love with the world and to um, pay more attention to bio civilizations that have been around for much longer than humans have. Um, and to kind of reframe our perspective on nature and Gaia. Um, and this is kind of also where Andreas comes in. So Andreas, uh, who is the host and curator of our past course, The Ecology of Love. Um, I'm not sure if any of the people participating in this meeting or um, in this webinar are past participants of the course. Um, but if anyone was watching in post, I'm sure there'll be a few. Um, Ecology of Love was one of our very well-received courses, um, co-curated also by Hannah Close, um, who was from Advaya. Um, and yeah, so a lot of the um, topics and themes of both of our guests' work really converse well together. Um, and so I thought it would be nice to bring both of them in conversation today. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to pass it over first to allow you guys to introduce yourselves. Um, maybe we'll start with Predrag. Um, Maybe you want to introduce uh, briefly uh, about your background, um, about the book, um, and then uh, Andreas can also go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Predrag Slyopcevic, and I'm... Um actually a scientist by profession doing biology, biosciences, molecular biology in particular, but um, I also studied uh, philosophy, so over sort of a couple of decades or three decades of my working life, I developed interest into, you know, the, um, the science philosophy interface, um, um, really asking a simple question, what, what is life? And this is a uh, sort of a uh, long-standing question that we're still searching for an answer. So, and I wanted to write this book, Biocivilizations, for a long time, and then eventually I got, um, found the publisher, Chelsea Green, and uh, written the, the, this book in about a few months' time, and it was published in May. So, Biocivilizations, essentially, is a, I guess, is a new name, but it just, um, it tells us that... Um, you know, uh, nature is much more complex than um, the human version of it. For example, I find um, a kind of uh, contradiction between the scientific term and the Anthropocene, which is relatively recent, is a 21st century term, which essentially means that uh, we humans uh, as a collective are almost the owners and controllers of the entire life on the planet. That's one side. But to, on the other side, we have nature that existed for about 4 billion years. Organisms like bacteria, amoebas, plants, fungi, animals, etc., who have been around for much longer than uh, we have. And uh, the main one of the main arguments in the book is that perhaps we lack this evolutionary experience, because we've been around for only maybe a couple of hundred, 300,000 years, whereas, um, you know, um, all other organisms uh, have been there much longer. 
and built this really uh, evolutionary experience that we are lacking. So the book is about how to reconcile um, our um, sort of attitude that's based on modern science. I call it mechanophilia, love for the machine, and this uh, essentially uh, the living world that we are part of, not separate from it, uh, and how to reconcile these two things, which, you know, on the other side is biophilia, the term coined by the great E.O. Wilson. And in the book, I say, you know, uh, perhaps there is a way for us to reconcile these two kinds of love, mechanophilia and biophilia. So the book is about that, but it's much more uh, wide in a sense, um, how many uh, examples I provide there from the natural world and maybe some lessons for us to learn from bacteria, amoebas, plants, animals, etc. So in brief, that's that's my introduction. Um, so we have lots of things in common, Predrag, like many things. And um, for example, um, the publisher, Chelsea Green, um, which also published one of my books, um, Matter and Desire and Erotic Ecology. Mm. And, um, and also the question, uh, the basic question, what is life, um, which I would really identify with as my one of my motivating questions. And, um, and we're both biologists and philosophers, obviously. <laughs> so what do we have not in common? <laughs> that will be the interesting question for the rest of the of this noon talk. Um, so my my, my um, passion actually is to try to understand this question, what is life from very much from the inside. So from our experience as living, living um, subjects, as living desires to um, maintain and bring forth ourselves. And, um, and that's more and more uh, a focus of my work. So I'm I'm working from our own experience as being part of life, and our own um, knowing and intuition and um, desire um, of and in and about this life as means to understand. And this understanding is not necessarily um, scientific understanding in classical terms like theory and empirical data, but it's it's more a, an understanding in terms of participating with, relating with, um, immersing in, and um, and also bringing forth. So an understanding of life as being, giving of life, maybe something like this. And um, so my work has become very practical. And um, I wonder when I will write the next book um, for all this practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm holding more and more uh, workshops and retreats in which I really try to, to somehow facilitate, facilitate this experience of being life, um, which is, I think, in the core of our of our um, experiencing in the first place, of our sensation of being here. And I think it's something which which we all have, which we can all access. We can all access in quite to quite a depth of understanding, but it's it has been severely underprivileged by our Western civilization. So it's somehow, this experience has somehow totally dropped from um, scientific, from the scientific perspective, and this is a huge problem. So the world has become pretty dead in many respects, and um, and that's it's as we know it's a it's a disaster and it's a suffering, but it's also a sort of perceptual distortion if we are part of life and um, can experience this and need to experience this, and it's somehow deleted from the official picture. Then this is. Um, a kind of pathology which makes everyone suffer. So um, my work is also meant to um, to heal this pathology in a way. I mean, um, uh, it, it hasn't been always like that. I mean, um, traditional societies, I mean, people living, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago had 
different views and that they are more integrated into nature. Um, and I know of an example, um, basically another author uh, that published a book with Chelsea Green, he has given a perfect example, uh, Lapland, that's North Europe. And this, these are, you know, uh, people that basically live, you know, th these are tradition, a, a traditional society that they had their own version of science. And um, basically, uh, how do we call this uh, long period in the North Pole when the, the daylight is? Um, they have their own term. It's Gu of Sahas in that, but it's it's um you know uh, those long polar nights, uh, and all all visit. Uh, 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 it's called Aurora Borealis. That's the scientific term, and all physicists know about that. And um, there was a, a question asked by a uh, reader of a scientific popular magazine in Sweden whether this or aurora borealis or go of sahas produce any noise um and you know uh, the traditional science of lapland says yes it's quite noisy you know but then in this swedish magazine a scientist professional scientist responded to this reader and say no there is no sound it's basically a um, these people are fooling themselves it's just a superstition um, that was about 2004 five, I think, very recently, maybe 15 years ago. And then there was a physicist from Finland, I've forgotten his name, and he was quite interested. He's interested in acoustics, and he went on to investigate, and he has proven that basically Aurora Borealis pro produces a kind of crackling noise. So it, it does have a noise, and then all the media announced that BBC, New Scientists, etc., but none of them acknowledged the traditional uh, knowledge of uh, these people. And uh, so I think science is, in a sense, if it's too mechanical, is separating us uh, from nature. So maybe um, what we need to do is to try to reconcile science with the traditional views. Lots of interesting ideas already. Um, I will probably, uh, as usual, go off the script. Uh, and maybe ask a few questions out of curiosity here and there based on what comes up. Um, but it seems to make sense to go to the second question now about life, um, since we kind of are coming to that question of like, what is uh, life? Um, I mean, in my question, I think, uh, Predrag, in Bio-Civilizations, uh, you write, uh, quote, organisms are constantly searching for meaning and that life is a meaning-making phenomenon. Um, and Andreas, this also, I mean, I've heard probably read versions of this in your uh, many books and uh, many essays and interviews of yours. So this is kind of a, the, same, the same words, um, but, and we are, Project, you are beginning to talk about this also a little bit, um, viewing the paradigm of viewing organisms as machines. Um, and so in the spirit of kind of moving away from that, um, and I would love to kind of unpack the idea of life as a meaning-making phenomenon, which I guess to some people might sound quite simple, but to others sounds a bit abstract and poetic and um, almost like non-scientific. Um, but of course, that's, I, I wouldn't say that's the case, um, but I would love to hear um, both of your thoughts on that. Uh, a little bit, um, and also specifically referencing um, Gregory Bateson, whom you both have quoted extensively as well, um, the idea of the difference that makes a difference. Um, so I would love for you to kind of respond to, to this a very open-ended question um, in relation to what we were kind of getting at earlier. My my own view is that uh, biology or the science of life, uh, the main sort of um, quality of that science of life or the main quality of life actually is cognition, uh, the capacity to know things. And 
uh, this differs, you know, the, the, the huge difference between living and non-living is, you know, the machines we're trying to produce, they, they don't know, they can't understand, they simply programmed uh, to do what we sort of ask them to do. But living organisms, all living organisms, irrespective of whether these are single cells like bacteria or amoebas, or multicell organisms like plants or uh, animals, they all have the same feature and that's sentience and consciousness. That's, uh, uh, this is uh, not only my own view, but this is actually becoming a scientific view in a small grouping of people, including myself and few of my collaborators. So we together now writing a new book, uh, still searching for a publisher we want to basically select not chelsea green but a science publisher like oxford university press so the key thing of life is sentience and consciousness so bacteria senti sentience means capacity to feel capacity to sense the world consciousness is something perhaps bigger maybe the sense of subjectivity having the capacity to feel its own body and the external world. Uh, but then cognition emerges when the organisms, bacteria, amoebas, plants, start interacting with their surrounding, with their environment. So the interactions between organisms in, and the environment are cognitive interactions. And that's where this meaning making process starts. And uh, I really sort of liked uh, what Bateson has written. He had a great book, The Mind and Nature, A Necessary Unity. And uh, in my book, you know, the epigraph for the first chapter in Biocivilizations is just a simple sentence from Bateson. Uh, mind is the essence of being alive. And he didn't publish that in any book. I think there was, uh, he has given that sentence in an interview by Friti of Capra. Friti of Capra is uh, a great, uh, he, he's a physicist by education, but then he has published quite a lot of ecological books. And he interviewed Bateson. Uh, uh, Bateson died a long time ago, but he interviewed him around 1977. And he, he sort of, uh, written that sentence and uh, he put it in his own book, Friti of Capra. So it's mind is the essence of being alive. So basically the quality of life is cognition. And for this reason, I think that all organisms have the capacity to learn, uh, not only about the environment, but, but about themselves. And only few scientists picked up this idea. One of the uh, rare scientists who picked up this idea was uh, Robert Rosen. He was a theoretical biologist and mathematician, and he used mathematics uh, category theory to prove really that the organisms are fundamentally different from machines. He called them anticipatory systems. Uh, and it, you know, that's the idea that really um, is um, compatible with Bateson's views, uh, with views of Maturana and Varela. I'm sure we'll talk about them later, but with, with some obviously differences. And, um, um, you know, uh, we do not need to agree about every single thing, but if we have sort of a, a common view, then things uh, could progress. But at the moment, science is quite mechanistic. Um, and uh, we are sort of trapped in this mechanized of a, you know view of life um, and whether we will be able to get out of it difficult to say but I think we have to try well that was very interesting and I generally concur um, and I'd add some some little raisins into the dough maybe um, I remember when I was an stu undergraduate student in the 90s, early 90s, 1990s, um, that was already my question, what is life? And I remember I had a, we had a biology, um, well, I was studying biology and we had a teacher, a geneticist. He gave a seminar, he taught a seminar called philosophy of biology or something. And I ran there, I was thinking, wow, this is great. This needs to be great. And um, it was hugely disappointing somehow because we didn't really affront this question. 
but we also read some nice poetry which wasn't really related to biology but it was nice so it somehow left a nice impression and I asked him um, actually um, I asked him what is life and he said um, compartmentalization building little compartments and that was all um, and I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's kind of like um, somehow incomplete, like vastly incomplete. And I remember that I, I just couldn't get this answer from any biologist in charge. So nobody would really talk about it. And if you look at biology textbooks, you don't find anything about this, interestingly. So there is, there is this tradition in biology to not talk about the, the elephant in the room, what is life. You will find details like, okay, life is compartments or genes or self-motility or um, receptivity or nerves or whatever whatever these these things but you will we won't have a de definition or a, a, an answer which somehow tries to outline something general and it, it is this is still the situation with with some notable exceptions like Frederick for example here and of course Bateson and of course um, Maturana and Varela, who was my teacher in Paris. And I want to just to throw in his definition because he gave a definition of life. And I remember when I came to his place, to his lab in Paris, and I started to read his own papers, which I hadn't seen so far. Um, he, you know, it was nice. I was in Paris and I was in this half underground lab and I could just look at his papers. He said, "Here's my, this is the other my papers. This is my library. You can look, look at, look at them." It was very nice. So he sat at his desk, and I kneeled on the floor and pulling out these papers, and then taking them in my little flat and reading them. Actually, I'm in Paris right now, so I'm, I'm kind of reconnecting to to this to this time in 1999, quite a long time ago. And um, and then he had this definition, and I was thinking like, "Oh my God! Wow! This is so incredible!" There's a guy who gives a definition, and it even makes sense. So his definition was, in, in a 1997 paper, life is a process of creating an identity. Life is a process of creating an identity. Hmm. It sounds very abstract, and that's the great thing of it, that it's very abstract. So that means that, and, and he built on his previous work with together with Maturana, where they said life is actually a self-creating mechanism or machine. And he says, life is a process of creating an identity. And what, what does he mean? I try to keep it very short. He, he, he means that an organism creates itself, builds itself materially, but it not only builds itself materially, it also builds itself as a self, as a standpoint from which it somehow experiences what comes, what comes along, what um, what is there, what um, what encounters it, and from the standpoint of self, everything becomes meaningful. And from the standpoint of self, um, this own identity is that which needs to be somehow conserved, protected, rebuilt. And um, the great thing is that. If you use this very abstract definition, um, first it's open to like any form of self-creation of an identity. You don't need to um, doesn't need to be biology. And second, it includes the experience of meaning, because if you self-create your identity, and something disturbs your creation of an identity, you have a problem. And if you have a problem, it is bad. And if you find something which is great, then it is nice. So in this definition, built into this definition, is this fundamental phenomenon Frederick was talking about of, um, of experience, of feeling. It has to do with this desire to self-construct our identities. So we, I, when I saw this definition in this basement of, of a, a building um, on this hospital area where he had his lab in Paris, I was thinking, you know, that was one of these moments where I was thinking, oh my God. So, so sentience is built into this abstract definition. World, world is meaningful because there is the creation of a perspective. And in his further work, Varela was very clear that we have to understand 
living organisms as selves, like ourselves, as perspectives, as meaningful existential experiences. And that's where, where I then started my work and we even published a paper on this. And um, so feeling is not something, some sweet flavor somehow added from the outside, but it's, it's a constitution. It's the constitution of, of, of life, of organism. It's, it's, it's inevitable. You can't, you can't take it away. It's like right in the middle. And um, and that's very interesting. So when you when you when you say what is life, when you ask what is life, then you have this embodied process, you have this identity creation process, but you have a concern, you have an emotional horizon, you have an emotional dimension, you have the dimension of felt subjectivity right in its middle. So we see that this world seen from this standpoint is full of inner experience. This whole living world is one huge. Um, multi-form inner experience and that is what is missing in the picture of science so far and that is what it what needs to be reintroduced and then science of course will will be very different but um because it's it can't act in a neutral world anymore if if, if there's so much sentience and so much concern and self-experience but um it's there from the from the beginning and it's not it's not something added from our observation standpoint, but it's right there constitutionally in the center of life. As you mentioned poetics, and I think that's that's essential in poetry. Um, Sometimes basically poetry, great poets or great writers have this capacity to, um, again, you, you, I'll use this ver ver word, feel, uh, much more deeper than scientists. I mean, a typical example is my favorite writer, Vladimir Nabokov, who was actually, bio uh, I mean, he had some uh, biology education because he was uh, interested in butterflies. And he worked at the Harvard, uh, at the Natural History Museum at Harvard during the Second World War, and he was classifying butterflies, basically. He was so successful, I think he published eight scientific papers on the classification of uh, so-called blues, very, very famous uh, butterf butterfly species. And he actually, uh, in those papers, proposed a theory as to how these butterflies came uh, from uh, maybe to, I, I can't remember exactly uh, which part of the world to which part of the world, but it was a hypothesis properly sort of formulated scientific hypothesis uh, about the origin of these uh, of this butterfly species. Uh, and during this his life, Nabokov died, you know, in, in the in the 20th, towards the end of the 20th century, no one was able to test this hypothesis. But curiously, only a few years ago, there was a great molecular biology and genetics investigation into the hypothesis. Someone wanted to probe uh, that. And actually, it, you know, Nabokov was proven right. And a, a series of commentators then, uh, people who had sort of poetic understanding of, uh, you know, merging science, science, poetry, and philosophy, they commented that you know, people like Nabokov, and they used also another example, Lynn Margulis, biologist, they had sort of um, deep understanding, almost shamanic understanding of nature that goes in many respects um, um, deeper than science, and they're not scared to propose new hypotheses, even though they may sound silly to scientists. And actually, they, they both, I mean, uh, Lynn Margulis, for example, she was interested in, in poetry. Uh, her, I think her favorite po poet was uh, Emily Dickinson, and she frequently quoted poetry in her, write, in her writings. Uh, so, you know, um, sometimes you need to merge different threads of thoughts, um, and poetry is a great example. And Nabokov, I think, uh, with his own uh, understanding of biology, through poetry, and I he was a professor of literature, um, and he was saying to to his students at Cornell, I think, um, in in a in in a sort of uh, work of art, um, two things sort of combined together. He called that 
precision of poetry and the excitement of science. And that's actually true. Uh, I mean, another example of a, of a you know, great poet or writer was Borges. He was, you know, a great poet or writer, and then he was deeply interested in science. So there is a way for science to reconcile with nature and maybe not only philosophy, but also poetry. And I, uh, you know, that's that's your idea, Andres. I also would like to add some, some more ingredients to this to this growing cake now, um, because it's it's brilliant. Thank you for for bringing Nabokov, and um, uh, as I love him very much for his. Um, work on butterflies and for his love for butterflies and as I love him for his literary work and he was actually I mean it's it's very interesting he was a an eminent butterfly scientist so he was somebody who and lepidopterist yeah exactly and it's it's um as it as it goes with these um insect subgroups there are very often um people who have most knowledge who are not scientists studied biologists at universities but who are these incredible lovers of of these forms so nabokov made huge contributions to that but he also wrote about butterflies from the standpoint of a poet and that's very interesting you know that's normally what what the biologists in 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 collections at museums don't do or they don't do publicly and i want to i want to read you something Okay. Um, I have to translate it from German because I quoted him in an, in an article I wrote about insect collectors some years ago. And he says, I quote, I, I, I translate on the go, um, mostly I enjoy the timelessness when I stand among rare butterflies and their, their um, foraging plants. This is ecstasy. And behind the ecstasy, there's something else difficult to explain. It is like a short vacuum in which everything flows what I love, a feeling of unity with sun and stone. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is a poetic description of a mystical experience. That's a mystical experience, a feeling of unity with sun and stone, a vacuum which is difficult to describe. So you see, um, he is he is stepping right through the experience, the connection with butterflies into an experience of pure aliveness, like like aliveness as such, which then um, becomes this feeling of unity, um, which somehow is aliveness in its in its let's say non non material non localized form, and he goes there through the butterflies, and this is so interesting because actually in many cultures butterflies have this role of somehow guiding us to the soul aspect of reality. And um, I know this from an, a Mexican indigenous culture, Raramuri culture, which is beautifully described in an um, indigenous scientist's uh, work, um, Enrique Salmon, famous, famous article um, about kin-centric ecology. And there the butterfly is actually the, the, um, the, the embodiment of the the creative power of the universe and it is also the form in which the souls of the dead fly to the stars that's the butterfly but we can we don't need to go to mexico we can i mean from europe i'm in europe right now we can we can go to ancient greek and look at the word but for butterfly with it, which is psyche hmm. psyche and it means soul as well and it means breath hmm. also means breath butterfly is breath and we can talk a lot about breath maybe we will as what actually breath is and what it does and what it shows about our connectedness and about our interiority um, but I, I don't want to do it right now I just want to again say that it's it's very important to integrate this um, the, the the perspective from the own experience on the level of my felt aliveness into a description of aliveness and that's 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 the example of Nabokov and you can see I think you can see where this leads us so we have we have vastly different ideas about um, the living world than if we 
if we cut short and say no 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 subjectivity at all we are we're objective scientists this is just fancy dreaming whatever so it was really really helpful and um yeah thank you we we could we could um invite other poets probably and um uh, that's that's one thing i wanted to mention um i'm i so much agree, agree with this that I've um, one of my books is even called the title is biopoetics so it's a little suggestion for how we could go and um, biopoetics and biopoetics is about what I, I name um, the poetic space which is this zone where life comes from and um, yeah, yeah I think that's that's important yeah, I mean uh, the, the the word uh, Poetry, basically, it, it comes from uh, the Greek word poiesis, which means making. So it's, uh, but uh, yeah, Nabokov is a great example. And I think in his uh, autobiography called Speak Memory, he says, um, uh, our life is just a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness, one, you know, before us and uh, one after us. But then later on, he says, in a sort of kind of mystical way, I rebel against this state of affair, affairs. So essentially, it's uh, you know, uh, life is greater than uh, science wants us to believe. <laughs> yeah, that's very important to keep in mind because because the problem of of this um, of this this let's say ideological use of of some of the ideals of science um, to cut away um, experience is that we 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 become totally depressed. Because this, this, because you know, if if our life is a little flash of light between between two uh, endless darknesses, then we are basically in a world where we need to to book the last cruise as quick as possible because we have to enjoy everything because we know then it is over and the light will go out and there will be nothing left and this this makes us to 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 uh, avid um, consumers who, who need to 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 take everything in as, as quick as possible. So it's a really depressing worldview. And I, I think it is completely wrong. It is completely wrong. And um, it's completely wrong. And it, it is enough to meet one butterfly to understand that it is completely wrong. And that we are actually included on the pattern of the butterfly's wings and taken into the, into the evening sky. And this is very, very different. Uh, in my book, I use the metaphor um, um, based on the dead parrot sketch, famous uh, Monty Python sketch. You all know what that parrot sketch is about. So, yeah, yeah, the, the Norwegian blue. Norwegian Pine blue. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And in my metaphor, basically, uh, the, science, the science was Michael Palin telling, ah, look, it's, it's alive, but actually it's dead. So science is trying to present life as, as a dead matter, which is completely wrong. <laughs> I'm going to interject here and like um, not moving away from where we're at. I think just kind of like moving into a topic that's kind of naturally, this, is, this conversation is kind of naturally leading to, which is um, the story of evolution. We've been talking about a little bit about like um, Andreas, you were saying that we we just look at the butterfly and we see ourselves in it. Um, that everything everything is different. Um, I feel like that's the kind of the effect that I have when I think about the story of evolution and how um, we've kind of got it all wrong. Kredra, you talk about this in your book as well. Um, and this kind of, I mean, in 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 short, right? We we were saying that the kind of idea that it's a story of natural selection. Um, it's a story of genetics. Um, isn't I? I mean, maybe saying it wrong. Maybe saying it's wrong is kind of um, misleading. But it's certainly not the full picture. Um, and the kind of real story, the wider story of evolution, um, involves kind of that poetic space and also involves kind of the idea of Gaia as like a living um, force on its own that has kind of inherent, an uh, inherent sense of creativity. Um, this is a bit of a ramble, but I wanted to kind of bring the conversation there 
and kind of probe um, either of you. I mean, we'll go into a <laughs> little bit of a conversation about it, but I would love to kind of hear your thoughts. Um, I know, Andreas, you've written a lot about this. Um, specifically, uh, I've read an essay of yours quite a long time ago, I think. And maybe it was like 2014. Um, <laughs> Uh, about this, about the the other narrative of evolution. So maybe we'll start with you, Andreas. Um, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts? So, um, well, maybe one thing first is evolution happens in terms of the the continuous variation and change of um, life forms and species and relationships and habitats happens. So, and it happens from itself from alone, through itself, from the inside, through this dance of um, unfolding desire for interaction and for relationships. Um, so that is very important uh, to, to see that this is this is real. What I would be critical about is the idea of um, natural selection in its in its strong form. And um, which overemphasizes the role of competition and which um, um, overemphasizes the meaning of the need for efficiency and which actually somehow paints a McKinsey picture of, of the biological world um, since Darwin has introduced it. And um, even probably uh, much more than Darwin, Charles Darwin himself would have loved to, to, um, to understand it, but we don't know. We know that in his first um, version of the, when he presented his um, big book um, um, about the um, about evolution, about the, about selection, he used a quote from a Swiss botanist um, as a motto, which says, "All nature is is at war." That was the quote, and that's the metaphor which I think is basically flawed. Um, and it's a projection from human society. So what we have to see is that when evolution, evolutionary, biological evolutionary theory was um, developed in the mid 19th century, um, we, we were in Victorian England with a, a totally bleak social situation. We had poverty, we had these impoverished um, people in poor dwellings who needed to work as industry workers, including children. We had a super high mortality rate. We had um, a ruling upper class who, who didn't care of this. So we had, we had the bleakest form of capitalism. And this was the scenario in which this evolutionary theory was born. So there was Charles Darwin, profoundly fascinated by life, really somebody loving of life. So a really lover of, of, of living beings. And um, who saw the the continuous variation, the continued variation of of life forms, and he he wanted to find something which was better than the idea of everything of this was created three thousand years ago by 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 the act by the hand of 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 an almighty God, and then he needed the mechanism for it, and while he while he didn't know what could be the mechanism for 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 let's say enticing um, developing species into certain directions, into certain manifestations of how they look like, how their bodies are built. He read an economist, he read Thomas Robert Malthus and Thomas Robert Malthus wrote about the, he wrote actually about the, the idea that there are he wrote about humans and he, his idea was there, there are so many poor people born which don't have a chance that only the fittest survive. So this is an idea from economy from Victorian times. It's actually a description of the horrible state of society, which Darwin read and he was thinking, oh, also in nature, there are always, there's always more offspring than, than finally comes to the reproductive age. So this is it. And I take this and this made it made much sense, but it made much sense in this in the in the eyes of the Victorian public, which was educated in the way the society functioned, and um, and this this was why this idea that competition and efficiency and fighting and war is so important 
um, became so ingrained in biology because it was the uh, the social, the cultural situation, and we have it to our day. Now it is it is more in the flavor of um, um, of how to um, how to maximize resource efficiency. So it sounds more like modern capitalism, but um, you have we have this discourse still in biology, and um, to my eyes, it overestimates the this um, the, the role of competition, and it doesn't see. Um, so much the role of reciprocity, the role of um, of the fact that every life form is always relational to others, um, and that domination is actually self extinction because of the dependence on that on which I feed. It um, overestim it underestimates the role of symbiosis. You you Tammy you use the word Gaia, so we know the work by. Lynn Margulis, who um, found that our body cells are actually um, symbiotic organisms who um, took in, in through evolution, um, cells who took in through evolution other cells and built an, a new sort of cell, which then became our body cells. And this is not war, this is uh, cooperation, this is symbiosis, this is something which we could call mutual transformation and um so there are all these relational events and there are all, all these co-desires and there are all these paradoxes of um, realizing myself only through the possibility that also you realize yourself which we don't really have a place in uh in the um th theoretical concept of biology and um and which 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 then means that biology evolutionary biology is pulled to the side of competition and efficiency in a, in a, in, a, in a way which is far too much overemphasized it's much more like a play in which um in which forms slowly shift to a certain side but not because those who have some traits which are disadvantages are mowed down like um, in a war e event but just because there's a tiny slighter chance that they will have offspring but it's not it's not really it's, it's not relevant on the individual level so it's it's a sort of dance or my teacher Varela called it um, natural drift it's more like it's more like um, the movement of waves or the movement of clouds on on the sky and um, it's very much about expression of possibilities, I'd say, and less so about um, about slavery to efficiency. And if we, if our culture could see this beautiful freedom and reciprocity in natural history more, we would have a totally different feeling because many people educated by popular magazines who who kind of like re, reboil recook this ancient idea of competition and efficiency um people are educated in this way of seeing this world as a bleak place of warfare where you have to prevail and to win and then again you're in you're in ego mode and you're in i'll i'll have to book my last cruise mode because because otherwise somebody else will book it and it's wrong and we would we would be really better off if we saw life as a dance with partners and I think that's that's actually what what it is, and um, and maybe we can work on this cultural metaphor if we change our culture, or this metaphor will change our culture if we work on it. Yeah, thanks, Andreas. Because... So it's, it's a great introduction to to this topic of evolution. I mean, uh, for me, basically, life is um, uh, I call it communal living. Uh, basically, life is not about single species, but coexistence of multiple species. And um, Gaia, which is basically all life, I mean, the, the metaphor, uh, I mean, the Gaia or the biosphere, basically, is not an organism, it's just a huge system that encompasses this communal living. And um, I compared it with a kind of natural democracy in the, you know, democracy of the biosphere, there are no privileged species, every species is equal. So where modern science brought us to is to the point that we 
sort of separated ourselves completely from nature. We want to own it, we want to control it, uh, and everyone else is just our uh, slave. Which is, and that's by the way, is, is not true. Uh, this natural system, the biosphere, we know again from Maturana and Varela, it's autopoietic, it has its own way of uh, arranging things. So uh, if we continue along this route, uh, you know, the biosphere will find its own way to regulate things. Uh, going back to Darwin, uh, actually, um, and Lynn Margulis, Lynn Margulis was just, uh, you know, um, uh, she was riding on a long way of biological thought from continental Europe, starting in Germany and Switzerland. The idea of symbiosis means living together. Uh, and this idea was uh, basically ridiculed by the mainstream science throughout the 19th century, throughout the 20th century, until Lynn Margulis published her paper in 1967, after about 15 attempts. Uh, so it was rejected, 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 and finally a journal called Journal of Theoretical Biology accepted that paper and it, it became a classic. And now the idea of endosymbiosis is part of biology. So life is about living together. So we are all inter interconnected. If you look at our own bodies, we are basically, as Lynn Margulis used to say, uh, societies of microbes. Um, if you look at, uh, it's not only that bacteria live in our guts, bacteria are essential for our, our development. The most recent research suggests that our brains cannot develop without certain bacteria. And there is a now, now a term psychobiome, bacteria that actually are required for the human embryonic development to lead development of the brain in the right direction. So actually we cannot think without bacteria. Uh, so, and um, uh, you know, uh, again, mentioning Darwin, before Darwin, uh, the, the greatest uh, theoretician of evolution was Lamarck. And Lamarck was much more um, closer to the idea of life as a communal force. And even Darwin himself recognized that. And I think Bateson revived uh, Lamarck and Lamarckism. He said that the greatest biologist in the Western uh, tradition was Lamarck, not Darwin, because uh, Lamarck was uh, sort of proponent of this idea that life is coexistence, even though his idea of um, you know, um, inheritance of acquired characters was wrong in the context of animals and plants, but actually new research suggests that it's not wrong in the context of bacteria and single cell organisms that lived for about 2 billion years before, um, you know, um, amoebas, for example, emerged and 3 billion years before plants and animals. So, you know, Lamarck and that idea of coexistence is uh, uh, basically in some biological circles now, uh, you know, quite a quite a uh, attractive uh, and well developed idea, and people are now trying to reconcile Lamarckism and Darwinism. And I guess this is, um, but there is still strong uh, resistance to to this because the mainstream thinking is still influenced by people like Richard Dawkins, and this is called neo Darwinism. They simply took this idea of natural selection, combined that idea with genes, and now the genes are the most powerful agents in biology. And genes, basically, when you analyze them properly, they can't do anything without cells. So cells have the capacity to feel, to, uh, to be conscious, and we are built of cells, trillions of cells, uh, the conglomerates of cells, and therefore, um, evolution basically is not about natural. I mean, natural selection is just one facet. What makes uh, cre creativity, you know, the, the way how new organisms are brought about since, um, you know, um, when two bacteria or bacteria and archaea joined together to produce amoeba about two billion years ago, ever since then, life is just symbiosis, basically merging together organisms of different kinds and communal living. 
So, um, and, you know, um, I quoted in my book, Lynn Margulies, who said, and her son, Dorian Sagan, uh, in one of their books, uh, they said, actually, that natural selection is an editor, but not uh, the creator. Creator is something completely different, symbiosis or something else. This communal living that brings uh, new experiences and new forms of life. And by the way, uh, we even don't know how many species exist in nature. I mean, the current estimates go between few million to few billion. If we include all the bacteria and all microorganisms, there could be about few billion species uh, in the current biosphere. Um, so that I, I, I thank you for the psychobiome. I didn't know that. Um, that's very interesting. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm immediately, to me, it's, it seems immediately evident. And... Um, um, so again, again, you see this, this coming back to Varela's definition of life as a process of creating an identity, creating an identity happens through somehow creating coherence among difference or through difference or with difference. So it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a surprise in a way that we say, well, actually we, we need bacteria to think it could be somehow sound strange, but actually it's, this is just the. The, the the gist of it is to to life is that which creates coherence from an underlying um, otherness from an underlying diversity and um and I think it's very important to to see um or let's say it differently to, to me it's very important um, to see that that there is this fundamental paradoxical, action or performativity in life um, which actually gave rise to these misunderstandings either on the one side or on the other side so one, one might see only difference and say well it's all about competition and difference and the other sees symbiosis and says it's all actually all about symbiosis but it is to my eyes about um, something like unity from difference or um individuation or um, mutual transformation so that actually self is is somehow always other or is always about other so actually this self-interested self is world which from a certain perspective is interested in itself so we keep this paradoxical difference in ourselves and live it and um and run into the problems this creates, but then can overcome them by, um, by let's say, reimagination of how to um, how to live uh, unity and difference. I would e I would even say, by the way, that 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 would be one definition for poetry. It's unity and difference. It's a whole which is made from parts which somehow rub against another which somehow are not really um resolvable in a, a coherent sentence because then you would write prose but you write you write poetry so there there remains something unclear but in the poetic expression in the poetic moment it makes sense and that's that's how life functions i would say and um and um i wanted to talk about my my favorite example, breath, a little bit in, in showing how this community indifference actually functions, like, like in every moment, because in every moment we somehow breathe and take a breath. And when we breathe, we breathe out ourselves. Everybody who knows my work somehow knows that I'm obsessed with breath, with this function of breath that while well, we breathe our bodies out, because we breathe out CO2 and the C, the carbon and the CO2 is the carbon from our body we breathe it out and then it's breathed in by other bodies namely plants and um, blue green algae and trees in the paris streets and then it becomes their bodies so we we already have in this in this fundamental physiological um cycle we have this uh communality how, how you call it which i like so we have this this Bio inevitable democracy. sorry I call it biodemocracy. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So we have lovely because this this also builds other bridges. So we have this 
fundamental entanglement which we cannot evade at all you see and if we are living in a commonwealth of breath it doesn't make sense to subscribe to a theory of um of of natural history which paints a picture of every being at war against the other it just doesn't make sense at all it's it's completely illogical and um um what what again was you was what 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 was the word you used i simply used the word democracy in the context of the biosphere i mean the meaning of that is that there are no privileged species all species are equal millions no, of billions of species and and that leads to the idea of biological democracy and you can say that you know biological elections are run now and then maybe a few every, you know every few thousand years where the the biosphere needs to assess uh, mm. its state <laughs> so maybe next time um you know uh, they'll kick us out who knows yeah um, yeah it looks very much like the human government is is on, on its way out actually yeah yeah in in, in and, the heart and i just want to bring here just one more quotation um uh, basically a scientist uh, i mean probably a biologist that uh, no one heard of his name is he's still alive he's over 100 years old now Antonio Lima de Faria he's Portuguese but he was a professor in uh, Sweden somewhere and he was a great bi great biologist but retired now and he has written a great book um, and I talked to him a few times he's an example of, a, of, of you know a scientist who thinks the way we think and he defined life as, um, he says, uh, life is a mirror through which universe looks at itself. Uh, and then basically if you, um, and I added in my book, uh, this is a composite mirror containing billions of billions of smaller mirrors. And basically what unifies us is our diversity not um you know we all different but this is what makes life uh unique it's unity in diversity if we go and promote our own selfish anthropocentric view of life basically we'll die as a species maybe not in 100 years or 200 maybe 500 years whatever so this is anti sort of uh life movement that we live at the moment I will try to summarize the question, but it's it's a little long, but I think um, I'll just read it out. Um, and so they say that I resonate with these understandings of material and biological relations and interconnectivity, but explaining it to others is a challenge. I wonder if from your experiences, you could speak to strategies that you have found generative when it comes to helping to basically pass this on, pass this kind of wisdom and perspective on. Um, and also, if there are any practical ways that you find helpful for inviting people who seem to be enclosed in and suffering from the hegemony of individualism or Western scientific perspective to be open to poetic relationality with the world. Um, and this person also asks if there's a good gateway question um, and how do you get people out of this bleak way of viewing life as competition, which is a great question. I would say briefly, uh, read both of our guests books <laughs> and essays that's one way um, and also read some poetry I guess but I would like to hear what you guys would say in response to this person yeah it's one of these questions or it's actually the question which which always comes is hey can how can we apply this to to make things better just just a bit posed a little bit differently and it's it's as 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 you as we all know, it's 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 a difficult question to answer because if we had a great answer, we already things were already better. So it's a it's a bit tricky. I I'll, I'll try I try by 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 joking first. I mean, of course, you should give them um, Pedrox and my books, so that that would be very helpful. <laughs> Maybe that's already enough. Um, but um, speaking seriously. Um, at this point, I would always recur to practical experience. I would actually not bother with explaining um, because then you're very much in this um, head zone where you put judgment against judgment. So you're, you're in, a, in the war of, of, of arguments and um, you, you won't con con convince, I think. But if you open, invite into opening into 
experience, then it could be very different. So I would, if I had this person with me, I would say, hey, why, why, why don't we go and have a little walk in the meadow at the forest fringe at sunset and just sit there and just wait and just let's see what's happened, what happens if just, just let's just, just, just go there and sit and then have a little sit spot exercise just be there or a little meditation or just sniff the flowers or watch the butterflies or lay on the grass and caress the stroke the 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 barge the bark of the trees so i would do this and um because i think this is actually the only access and if if it leaves something then it's good and if it doesn't leave anything then you would not not for nothing in the world be able to convince this person through arguments Um, my answer is um, is similar in a sense that um, you know the question is really difficult. No one can give. There is no magical answer to it. But what we can do, just give a practical advice. And actually, science, uh, if you look at the science of ecology, is quite practical and actually realized that the human, the Western science of ecology, the modern science, actually cannot resolve some important ecological problems. You know, uh, they encounter a big ecological problem, apply artificial intelligence, various models, and they can't do anything. And they recognize that. And paradoxically, they talk to native peoples, you know, North American Indians or some other communities, and actually they have solution to this. And this is now called traditional ecological knowledge. Science called this traditional ecological knowledge and actually asks for advice from them. Actually, they invite, you know, conferences invite these native peoples to share experiences with them. Um, and um, the biggest, one of the biggest science publishers, Cambridge University Press, they published a book called traditional ecological knowledge, knowledge written by um, the community of North American Indians that uh, all of them have some sort of uh, uh, understanding of science. Some of them are professors, but they also have, uh, you know, uh, native uh, understanding of nature. Uh, so, um, and in my book, I said, you know, if we want to continue mechanistic science, okay, that's fine. If everyone wants that, they can do that. But at least we could have a reserve option. And that reserve option in the case, say, mechanistic model, model, models fail, is to use traditional ecological knowledge combined, and I said that, with autopoietic um, understanding of life, uh, Maturana, Varela, Bates, and Margulis, and my colleague, I just want to mention my colleague, I'm not sure whether you heard of him, Andreas, uh, Sergio Rubin. He's, uh, he's working now in uh, Br Brussels, and he published a paper in 2021, scientific paper in which, in that paper, he clearly showed using mathematics and physics and chemistry that our models, mechanistic models of um, trying to basically move the biosphere in one direction would never work because the biosphere is autopoietic it has its own ways of regulating things regulating itself and that is to trying to basically um this is you know uh, all of us are different and uh you know unity in diversity whereas our own is you know, scientific approach only sees the human way of things in many respects uh, limited. I wouldn't say wrong, but limited. I, I go just go back to um, the amazing Enrique Salmon, um, our colleague, the the anthropologist with indigenous roots, and he is. Um, I, I had him. I, I I know him a little bit, and I I invited him for a seminar I was teaching in Berlin, and he. Um, He's talking about, he's also, he, he's giving a seminar, he's teaching a seminar at, um, at um, I think, Oakland, Oakland, University of California in Oakland, uh, where she, he, he is or he was until his retirement. And he is, this seminar is Indigenous Science 
It's called indigenous science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just to show that science, we don't, don't, it's not that Westerners have a, a monopoly on science. And, and you know what indigenous science, the, the, the basic exercise in indigenous science, in the indigenous science seminar for the students is to sit outside at a certain location for one hour every day, either in the morning or in the evening, um, and just to sit there, do nothing and sit there. And this is part of indigenous science, you know. And um, and that's that's just I just wanted to connect to 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 what you said, Pedro, about um, about the, the 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 urgent and um, necessary role of indigenous cultures to um, help Western global culture heal from this one-sidedness and 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 lend these practices which seem so simple but then are super profound I mean I can imagine these students saying like oh my god I have to do this as part of the seminar I have to write something and I have to I have to come assign it otherwise I won't get my credits and then they sit there and then suddenly World, the world unfolds and starts to speak to them, and then then they realize that they they have an organ of understanding which they didn't even know about, and everything changes, and every everything become becomes different. And um, I, in my work, I have been heavily orienting versus these animistic cultures and their ways to do, and I've also cooperated cooperating started to cooperate with with um, indigenous actors and indigenous scientists. And there's an amazing group in Australia, which I'm connected to, which is this mix of um, Aboriginal scientists and Aboriginal actors, ag activists and agents and Anglo-Australian scientists, which is just amazing. And they have started actually, just, just to tell you one thing, um, they have started to incorporate country as a co-author in their papers, you know, country in Australian means the the living place you're 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 speaking from or you're speaking as you're speaking of. So they have they have country, this particular country, it's Bawaka country, I think, and it's it's first author in their papers. Isn't this amazing? So so they voice country and um, and it's of course it's science, and I can really invite everyone to look at these papers. I. I've even I'm, I'm I'm in a special issue where where there's there's some of this stuff right now in in an, in a journal and published something and it's 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 really heartwarming to see how this can change. I mean, ten years ago it wouldn't have been thinkable that a journal um, which is part of Cambridge University Press, by the way, accepts that the first author is Bawaka country, but it it can happen. It does happen, and this is wonderful that science is able to open up to this this first person experience of life itself yeah that that's a great example i uh, in my book i've given another one which is more related to medicine i mean the nobel prize for um, chemistry in 2020 was awarded for discovery of uh, the method called crispr Two ladies got this uh, Nobel Prize. CRISPR mean, you know, it's a method for for sort of uh, um, editing the human genome for eradicating genetic diseases. Um, and um, I commented together with one microbiologist, James Shapiro, who's um, who's a great scientist, by the way, that uh, we should have acknowledged bacteria because bacteria discovered this three billion years ago. So we simply um, sort of uh, plagiarized the bacterial discovery and used it, um, you know, uh, for the human purpose. Uh, so that's, um, and by the way, the um, uh, in this book, Traditional Ecological Knowledge, they call this um, traditional science, they call it native science. So native science is the most, um, is the oldest form of science we humans know of. It's uh, basically maybe, you know, 50,000 years old or, or more. Whereas the you know the modern science is only about 300, 400 years old. Okay. Wonderful. For now, um, I will point uh, everyone to the upcoming course by Civilizations with Predrag, um, which is a six-week course um, all about biocivilizations, um, and will be kind of a expansion uh, of his book and also an invitation to dialogue about the dean themes and topics and ideas in that book. 
Um, and also with our new website, I also want to point people to the fact that if you join as a member of um, Advaya, you can also get access to a lot of on-demand courses, including Andreas's Ecology of Love, um, and also on the many sessions that he's spoken on our various courses in the past. So um, if you're interested to learn more, um, you can also now access Andreas's course um, in post, uh, which means you can watch all of the recordings and get all of the resources as well. Um, so the learning can continue there. Um, but otherwise, there's also a lot of free resources, interviews and essays from both of our guests. So you can go ahead and start with that if you would like to dive more into all of this. Um, and yeah, so really appreciating everyone who is joining us live, um, everyone who listened in to this conversation. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Um, and I will allow you both to uh, leave us with a parting thought um, before I close officially. Um, maybe Andreas, you wanna go first and share like a, a parting thought for us for the rest of the day and then pressure I can go and then we can close. <laughs> no pressure, can be something really small also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, well, one of my spiritual teachers always said, is there anything more fantastic than to be totally without thought? And you just caught me in this moment. <laughs> so, so I was just immersed in being alive. No, no, I'm joking. So actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm just just want to express my gratitude to to be to be, have been in this and thank you Pedro for for this wonderful um um reciprocal baking of this cake of life and i'm actually very curious to to look at your work and it's very nice to see that that this this is going on and unfolding and when i started um, in the 90s with as a as a disciple of arella it 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 looked like this would grow but then it didn't really and it's 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 so it's still it's still somehow in its infancy but i really feel that that now the the paradigm shift in biological thinking can 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 come and can happen and and today it gave me really an, a very optimistic feeling and it was it was it was beautiful to to be part of this and it it, this also goes to every one of you in the audience because we we have been in this space together. So thanks thanks to everyone here. Um, uh, thanks, Andres. Um, I mean, um, I, I mean, my, my summary of um, or a kind of message, uh, perhaps um, just remember Bateson's words. Um, you know, a mind is the essence of being alive. But also, there there was another great writer. Arthur Kessler, um, who has written also some uh, sort of popular science books. He said that uh, the brain is the only organ we don't know how to use. And he called that unwanted evolutionary gift. So brain is not the only organ that gives us experience. And I completely agree with Andras. Just go to nature and feel it. Feel it without brain. So then... Um, rewards come not through credits but through your own body and uh, well-being of your own body thank you so much andreas and frederick and um thank you to everyone in the audience thank you to everyone also watching in post um yeah we will be here doing courses conversations and events in this space have a great day everyone thank you so much